Hello and welcome to Money, Money, Money. I'm Sumera Abadi. The end of the year typically is when we see a whole host of students heading abroad for higher education. And if you're looking to study within India, then, you know, just add a few more months to this. But irrespective of where a student is headed, higher education is becoming expensive. And therefore, you need to plan well in advance about how you're going to fund it. In fact, this is an exercise that parents need to start years in advance. If not, there are education loans which are available as well. So we'll discuss both the aspects, how to be financially prepared if your kids are still young. And you can invest to create that corpus or if kids are already old enough, how to opt for a loan. Vishal Dhawan, founder and CEO of Plan Ahead Advisors, now joins in. Hi, Vishal. Thanks very much for joining in. So when we talk about education, the one thing that we want to talk about first is education inflation. You know, what is it? How much has it been in the past? And what is the rate at which it's likely to trend going forward? Thanks, Omera, for having me over. I think this is a, an extremely important topic, and I think it requires a lot of attention from parents. Um, so typically, the way we look at education is that most people tend to think about education as the tuition cost, which comes with education. But actually, you have a whole lot of other costs which come along with that as well. So, uh, for example, there is a cost of living. Most or very often, uh, children live away from home when they're doing higher education. So there is a cost of hostel, or maybe they have an apartment which they're sharing with someone. All of those costs go into cost of living. Their food, their uh, textbooks. Uh, now there's technology. So, you know, there's laptop upgrades, uh, other software that might be required, et cetera. And then, of course, there is the, tri the travel cost. So if you're, uh, you know, sending a child to live in a city outside, then you may be visiting the children, uh, the child, uh, you know, often, or the child might be coming back to India if he's overseas. So all of these are effectively costs that come together when you think about education inflation. Uh, over the last 10 years or so, education inflation has roughly been between 10 and 12% per year. So very clearly, it's much higher than what happens for other items, which are more like 6 to 8% per annum. And there doesn't seem to be any evidence yet that this rate of inflation is going to slow down in the future. So I think when you're planning for it, you'd once again at least want to plan for a 10% per annum sort of inflation as far as education is concerned. Okay. Uh, should education inflation only be considered if kids are looking to go abroad? Or does it matter even for, say, uh, premier colleges in India? Well, I think education inflation is there everywhere. I think the triggers for it may be different in different geographies. So, for example, if you're planning to send your children overseas, you could find that there are triggers coming from a combination of just the increase in cost of education plus the currency depreciation. While if you're looking at Indian costs, even at the premier institutions, let's say the most premier institutions in India are the IITs and the IIMs. If you look at those as well, you can see fairly substantial amounts of inflation taking place there. Because one of the common threads that's happening everywhere is an upgrade, upgradation of infrastructure. And obviously that comes with cost. Uh, the second is, you know, uh, academic costs are going up for teachers, etc. And therefore, there are cost increases happening there as well. And thirdly, in most geographies, including India, uh, the private sector is taking over as far as education is concerned as well. And therefore, you end up once again seeing that inflation is, a, is something that you need to plan for, irrespective of where your child is going to. And, uh, you know, it's not just the tuition fees itself, right, but the costs associated if you're looking to live in another city. I mean, forget another country, but, you know, you have to pay rent, uh, you know, rent are through the roofs in some of these big cities. So it's not just tuition, right? Uh, Vishal, you recommend that the, uh, the funding for this education should include everything, the entire ecosystem. Absolutely. I think one of the great ways for people to plan for this is to actually go out and speak to parents whose children are actually, you know, uh, having um, uh, higher education costs currently happening. And if they look at only tuition, they may be surprised at how small it is as c in comparison to all the other costs that are associated with it. Yeah. But uh, would you recommend for those who are looking to save, like say somebody has a 10 year plus kind of a time horizon, 
Uh, the CHOIL plan uh, that's available through mutual funds or, uh, you know, insurance companies, is that recommended or would you recommend a more diversified uh, portfolio? I think one of the most important things when you're planning for education or any goal which is 10 years plus out is that you need a lot of flexibility because it's very difficult to know exactly when you require the money, how much money will be required in which year, etc. And therefore, look for solutions that are flexible. I think that's where you'd find that, you know, child insurance plans typically are not very flexible because they very often, you know, have a template which goes with it, which assumes that you will require the money at a certain phase, etc. Uh, as far as child mutual funds are concerned, they are very much like aggressive hybrid funds, which means that they have roughly between 65 to 80% of the money in equities and the balance in, uh, in debt. And they do tend to have a minimum five-year lock-in. Now, what happens is that if you're looking to invest in anything which has equities in it, as you get closer to the requirement of money, you want to be able to get more conservative because you don't want to get hit by a, by a sudden shock that happens when you require the money and find that equity markets have fallen just when you wanted to draw out of that. And I think that's why diversified strategies are actually very good because in the initial phase, you can be aggressive, invest in equity because you have time in your hands and you can therefore get potentially a higher return. As you get closer to the requirement of money, you start to move to debt. And also how much you pull out of those monies can vary depending on finally which course your child goes to and how you ultimately choose to fund it. Okay. Um, uh, Vishal, uh, the other thing is for somebody, I mean, uh, you're investing according to the child's risk profile, I'm assuming. So it would be pretty much similar to everybody who's looking to uh, start creating this corpus, right? So would you recommend this uh, similar kind of asset allocation in their uh, portfolio as well? Not really. I think the decision in terms of how to uh, choose this mix of assets should be driven by how many years you have to get to the point where you start to have to starting to draw down. So the longer time frame you have, the more money you could have exposed to equities. The shorter the time frame you have, the lesser amount of money that should go to equities. Because you definitely don't want to have a situation where something that happens either globally in India uh, or in India means that your corpus actually becomes much smaller than what it was. So, uh, Vishal, the other thing is, how would uh, somebody manage the currency depreciation on their education goal? So, two things very, very importantly there. One is factor that in while you're planning. I think what tends to happen is very often we see uh, parents, you know, take today's cost of education overseas and then multiply it by today's currency rate and then get a number, and then they tend to grow that number. I think just like you're applying inflation on education, you also need to apply uh, currency depreciation because traditionally, the Indian currency has depreciated by 3 to 5% uh, every year over a period of time. In addition to that, if you have time on your hands, uh, you're, you're starting off soon enough, then you definitely can take advantage of the fact that you can also buy international investments in India today. And therefore, you could be buying, for example, a dollar-based investment itself, which means that over a period of time, the currency depreciation may not be something that you have to worry about. You can only focus your energy around the, uh, the inflation on the education itself. Okay. Uh, with that, we're going to take a very quick break. Vishal stays on with us. And uh, on the other side, we'll talk about how to go about if you need to take an education loan. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.